I, I laughed and, and shifted one of the salt and pepper shakers and hit the table. I thought the joke was going to be over, but then he takes the pepper and knocks the salt over and has the <laughs> table again. So I take the salt, throw it over my shoulder, and he reaches over the table and hits my buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> It was nice. Creativity. Creativity is, is something really lost, I think, <laughs> in the modern mind. Yeah. You know, want to hear something We're, horrifying? Yeah, go for it. Yik Yak's back. <laughs> what? <laughs> the, like, the message board for yeah, yeah. colleges? Yeah, like that. That is terrible. That's horrifying. That, that hellscape, that... I don't even know what to call it, yeah, but... Mm. People mm-hmm. to just be saying things, whatever's on their mind. It is it is completely licit to have an unexpressed thought. This is true. Who was it? Descartes or Hume or somebody who said all the problems of the world are because a man cannot sit quietly in his room by himself? Oh, I don't know. I don't think that was Descartes. Well, it sounds like what Descartes did. Yeah. I forgot who said that. i got to look it up and edit that in. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Welcome to the Sem Says Podcast, the podcast where seminarians say what's said at the Sem. I'm your host, Nikolai Vrilinski. I'm Alexander Brown. I don't know why I used my full name this time. Reverend Mr. Reverend Mr. Alexander Brown. That's right. Yeah. Since our last appearance on the internet, Alex was ordained a transitional deacon. And so now is very holy. All of his problems have, have wisped away. Melted away. He's, completely melted away. He's ready for canonization. You know, there's a uh, a joke in Dungeons & Dragons that at a certain point it becomes more lucrative that if a wizard loses his spell book to buy a new wizard than to buy a new spell book. <laughs> Very similar with deacons. <laughs> I have the, the Roman, uh, their own book of blessings. If I lose that, just find one of the other deacons. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> but yeah, today we, we opened talking about creativity. And I think imagination has to do with that. Maybe we could talk about that and, and how that plays into what you're working on right now, your MA and that kind of a thing, and what we've been practicing together at Visio Divina. Um, oh, yeah, that does tie in. I didn't yeah, even think of that. Yeah, all that kind of just ties in. So just to get the ball rolling, I read Bernard Shaw's play on Joan of Arc. Somebody referenced it. That's why I decided to read it. But basically, Joan of Arc had visions of three different saints. I think it was... Michael, Catherine. St. Michael, yes, St. Catherine. And... Another one, I forget. I kind of can't remember. Uh, Are you sure it was three? I believe so. Um, And she had visions of the saints, and they kind of, like, instructed her of what was God's will for her, what was her mission to do. And in Bernard Shaw's play, when he's describing her being interrogated, the interrogator basically says that, like, you didn't have visions, that was just your imagination. And she responds, well, of course, how else would God communicate with me? And I think, like, that's kind of a really beautiful insight, Um, even though Bernard Shaw wasn't, you know, a faithful Catholic, and maybe he didn't mean this insight by it, but I do think... That, that it's there nonetheless, of the fact that God doesn't just have to, like, function in, in the way that we want to uh, shoehorn him into, into this way of acting, but he interacts however he wants, and one of those ways is through our creativity, through our imaginations. So he can inspire in us by the use of our imagination, by the use of our creativity, even, like, you know, daydreaming, we can, we can be drawn closer to God through those things. So that's something that that I've tried to reflect on a little bit more, especially when I'm doing prayer time or maybe a holy hour, that I don't, you know, you, you don't try to get distracted and you try to avoid, you know, just uh, going into rabbit holes of distractions, but also recognizing that God can even use like daydreaming or as, as means of communicating to us, of, of sharing his will to us, if you will. Right. St. Margaret was the third, by mm-hmm. the by. By the by. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's it's true. Obviously, I agree with you. Because what is a podcast except... That's right, an echo chamber. So... <laughs> <laughs> the 
Nice. <laughs> no, it's true. Well, what's interesting is that the, the, the ability to imagine is really a facet of the soul, right? Mm. I think it's a very compelling fact because the things create like things. So it's a bit of a problem when you think of the brain as creating immaterial realities, hmm. right? So you, you have this, this muscle conjuring up that which is not there. It, it really is something of a problem. I mean, I'm not a neurologist. I'm also not necessarily a good philosopher, but you can go down rabbit holes of saying, well, it's electrons and neurons and synapses and your what have you and firing and this and that and the other thing. But just breaking it down doesn't actually explain why I can picture an apple in my hand. Yeah. I was only able, I'm only able to do that because there's a metaphysical reality generating and causing unity yeah. between all of the the stuff in my head, yeah. which is organizing in such a way that I am able to think of it. So imagining is really a unique to being person, being a, a human being. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then I mean, you can do whatever you want with that, but in a Christian mindset, and consequently, or not so much consequently, but rather uh, reciprocally, as a consequence of it yeah. being a, a reality, the Christian theology posits that it's we're made in the image likeness of God. So it's godly to imagine is really what I'm, I'm working okay. towards. It's godly yeah. to imagine. And what distinguishes imagination from uh, an imagination being uh, a vision or a, a fruit of prayer is if it's internal or whether it's external, I think. So I have friends who, they're not Christian. They're quote unquote good people. Mm -hmm. Were it not that we're all depraved, it's a Lutheran joke. Yeah. No, they're good people, but they, they, they're not Christians. They, they take time to meditate, which is good and wholesome. And they really reap benefits from it. And I wish I spent more time uh, having a good think. But it's not prayer because it's not going anywhere. Hmm. You see what I mean? It's sure. not, it's the soul is not being elevated to the standard with which, where which prayer can take it. Mm hmm. So you, it is a very uh, nerve-wracking thing when you're praying, and you're like, "Well, is that a daydream? Is that just me, you know, thinking about lunch? Am I am I doing this myself, or is this being something that's is this something that's being offered to me by the Lord?" Yeah. Um, it, it, that requires a, a very very serious level of discernment there, and I think it comes down to if you're discerning as like, "Well, is it bringing me out of myself, or is it staying internally?" Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really curious, and, and I think really good insight about like imagination is is in the image of God, right? Like God is obviously like he's creating and he's creating wonderful things. Like the whole world around us is his creation. And just like a, as an example, like Pokemon or something, like the creator of Pokemon had to make up stuff. And it's all mostly based on things that already exist. But like from God's point of view, he had to make up stuff that was entirely new, entirely right. creative. Yeah. So, so that ability to be creative, to be imaginative, yeah, I think that's a, that's absolutely like based on on God's creativity and and such. So right, really, which is beautifully expressed and commentated upon by Tolkien in the first part of the Cimmerillion, the Anu Lindle. Hmm. I think I was homeschooled, so I do that thing where if there's a really long word, yeah, I just. I see it as more of a picture than a, <laughs> than a word. <laughs> We're gonna get a million emails critique your your pronunciation of Anna Lindley. That's that's possible. The Lord <laughs> of the Rings fans, the Tolkien scholars, they're all they've all been activated <laughs> by, <laughs> by the Rings of Power. They're they're prowling the internet on this <laughs> this uh I don't know, this partisan warfare. <laughs> so okay. All right. Speaking of the Rings of Power, let's we'll come back to your point about the, the Anna Lindley in a second. But talk about the Rings of Power. Maybe we could just say one reason why it's bad is because it's not very creative. That's true, yeah. Can we say that? I think we can say that. Well, it is and it, it isn't. It isn't and it isn't. I'll actually, I have a, I'll, I'll give it credit where credit is due. It's ca trying to tell a story, yeah. which is a, a facet of creativity. The reason I don't like it is because I think Tolkien's world is an insular world. Mm. I forget who wrote the book, but there's a book that's entitled Morality, Religion, and Tolkien. Okay. And, and long story short, one of the chapters, he makes this... this point about Tolkien's work being a myth hmm. and the reason it's a myth is because there's a number of reasons it's a myth but one of the most striking reasons is because it's self-referential okay so that it it treats itself like it's a real story yeah right stories don't you're right it should make sense but like it 
then it's not always not always like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, I'm trying to think of an example, like maybe how um, like, like Star Wars is a long time ago in a galaxy yeah. far, far away. Like it doesn't really treat itself like a real story in the same way that the Tolkien's does. Right. That's a good. That's a good yeah. uh, comparison. Or thinking. What's the um, what's the series like? Mocking J. Oh, the Hunger Games. Fire. The Hunger Games. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking the Hunger Games. Because you know a little more about that than I do. That's like takes place kind of like quote like in the near future, sort of the yeah. opposite side of it. It's like yeah. This could happen, but it hasn't. You see what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it could, but it hasn't. Sure. But Tolkien has references to papers that don't really exist, like, people that don't really show up in the in the books. Mm. And it takes itself seriously. Right. It, it, the ebb and flow of the, of the work, I think, matches the tone of what's happening. Mm. Which is more my comment than, than I think the, the author that I was reading it from. So, when, when it's sad, the whole work become somber hmm. and I think when it's more joyous the word choice is is more like fast paced and quick which might just be sure. my, my reading into it but I think that's that's part of it where was I going with this oh the rings of power yep so Tolkien essentially created or or single handedly influenced contemporary fantasy yeah I think we've talked about that before yeah. there are a number of people who will prove that he hasn't in the way in in a single-handed way but I think anytime you have the word orc in anything, mm-hmm. you have Tolkien to thank for that because he essentially reintroduced orc as a as a race, as a thing, mm-hmm. race, but as a thing into into fantasy. So you have Dungeons and Dragons where you can play as as a half orc fighting orcs. Sure. That's and that's of course because we have a Tolkien influence. The problem what that did is uh, it it turned the Lord of the Rings not into a self referential, self contained work. It turned it into a, an aesthetic, sure. where you can just sort of don the Middle Earth look and uh-huh. and persona, but reintroduce yourself into the work, which I think is what the Rings of Power is doing. The Rings of Power, the the characters act and behave in a very colloquial way. Mm-hmm. Like the, what it comes down to me is like the characters say okay, sure. Like the words okay, okay, I'll go. That's us. That's us. That's something we say. That's not yeah. something that the Tolkien characters would say. Not yeah. because he, not merely because of the aesthetic that he's writing in an antiquated fashion, but because, because there's a there's a grandiose mythos in yeah. the work, yeah. and I think that's the danger with the Rings of Power is is because it, it's not so much an expression of Tolkien's world or or a glimpse into his mindset. It's just Dungeons and Dragons, the television show. Sure. Which but, means it's which people are like, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it's, I'm sure it's not bad. But it's not Tolkien, and it mm. shouldn't be branded as such. That's just writing on his coattails. That's lazy. That's that's not creativity. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry, that was very long winded. I'm sure. Yeah, that, yeah, that should that's be fine. A... No, I think that's a good um, good insights too. Yeah, because when I think of something being creative, uh, like like when I'm really interested in something, even like speak of the Hunger Games, it's because it's like a new idea. Mm-hmm. At least you know, at least for me at this time that I'm consuming it or, or whatever. And, like, that's what's creative. It's like, wow, I've never thought about a world in which blank happens. Or yeah, sure, thing. sure. I mean, like, at this point, like, we're all kind of sick of superhero things because it's not new anymore, you know? Yeah, they just, they just up the ante, like, yeah. the world is going to... Like, how many times can you save the world? Like, it's... Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's Gotham City, sometimes it's, like, this region, but it's always, like, the world is right. on, on and the like, line. And so, you like, you've lost imagination and creativity there versus, like like, something... That even is very low stakes, just a new story, a new world, like that can be new and creative and, mm-hmm. you know, attention grabbing too. So I think the same thing with that. Like even if you set a new story in, in an old existing universe, but it's it's something actually new and not just a retelling, mm-hmm. I think there's something there. That being said, I think that's that might be why the Assassin's Creed games are so compelling to me. Hmm. Because it is a completely out of place anachoristic story mm-hmm. in in a time period that I'm familiar with. Mm. That's neat. Yeah. Never really thought about that before. I'm circling way back, the Anna Linlay thing. Yeah, and so, Anno Lin I think it's Annu Lin Okay. We'll just we'll edit it in. We'll yeah. like hard cut to this word. <laughs> <laughs> um But describe that so the beginning of the Silmarillion, what what does that mean? So so Tolkien, what's what you'll find with Tolkien is a huge theme is sub-creation, 
what we would probably call in in Catholic theology procreation. Okay. In a way, there there there's overlap, but they're not exactly the same thing. But in the first part of the Cimmerillion, it begins with with Aluvatar, who in Arda is called Eru, and he creates from his mind he creates the holy ones, the Ainur, who are angelic beings, explicitly not having physical form, incorporeal beings, mm. who are in the dwelling place of, of God. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So they're choirs of angels. And he teaches them how to sing. He he gives them voices, and it's very beautiful how it's expressed. If I, I know if, if Tolkien isn't really your thing, I think you should read the first 17 pages of the Cimmerillion, thereabouts, depending on what version you have. Mm. Just read this part. It, it's very, very beautiful. He teaches God teaches the angels how to sing in this world, and their voices are like pipes and cymbals and violas and trumpets, and they all have, uh, or choirs of angels. They all have their their unique voice, and Aluvatar gives them a theme, teaches them how to sing, and he says, "I'll sit and hark and, and listen to your words," and Aluvatar sits back, and over time, with Aluvatar's theme in mind, the angels learn how to sing in harmony and they mm. kind of get a feel for how to sing together in accord with the Louvatars. And it takes time. It takes time yeah. for them to f- discover their own voice and to put it into context of this larger theme. And then, of course, it's a very heavy-handed cosmology. Sure. One angel leaves and just gets kind of curious and he wanders into the void by himself and there he learns to sing a new song so uh, his name being Melkor, who the elves later call Morgoth. Melkor returns, and he tries to introduce a new theme into the into the music, and is very c- confusing to the angels around him. So mm. they start tuning to him. They either tune to him, or get confused and stop altogether. Mm. And there's a clash of music, and in that clash, Aluvatar tries reconciling it and tries drawing Melkor back to himself. And Melkor refuses, and Aluvatar gives him another chance, and calls him back to himself. But ultimately, actually, this is this is I'm, I'm pausing because this is kind of a, an interesting point. It's not just like to teach Melkor a lesson, uh-huh. but rather, Aluvatar uses his opportunity to reveal the gravitas of the music. Aluvatar says, "So that you understand, no theme of which you can conceive does not have its utmost being in me. Mm-hmm. I will give your music a life, and I will say, Ea, to be, let it be." Mm-hmm. And Aluvatar revealed to the angels that their music created Middle Earth, not just Middle Earth, um, all of Arda, which is like the world. Hmm. Middle Earth is only a small part of it, huh. which is why the Earth has a harmony amongst itself. Why the water interacts with the trees and then grows and interacts with the soil. Why yeah. there's a, an interplay in that. It's it's Tolkien had a very hmm. keen sense that the world was unified and intelligible, like music is. So huh. there was that that wow. interplay there. But it's very interesting also that Tolkien had an insight that, that creation is uh, subsidized and delegated as sure. to levels and levels and levels. Yeah. So that you have these levels of, of Ainur and Meyer and elves and men, and they all have this like way of interacting with the world, which I think was more pertinent to the original point after having summarized okay. this, this book. I really like that that imagery, too, of music. Like, I'm not a musical person very much, but like I think like that's very keen and that's very... I don't know. I, like I see the emotional weight of that. Okay. Of being yeah, like yeah. like yep. music turning into being, and like what you know, calling the angels persons in the circumstance. What a person can offer of himself, like that, enters into the world and becomes something. And like it becomes a reality, and but it's not through my own power, but it's through the gift that like that that god has given me of creativity Mm -hmm. and so like i can introduce things into the world into reality based on that right um not limitlessly but but to the limit of you know my imagination my creativity itself Mm -hmm. it's it's interesting i don't think you mentioned in the simulating but rather in the book of lost tales which is sort of a a precursor not a precursor I, i think their book of lost tales is made primarily from tolkien's notes and it's sort of like the Cimmerillion, but as if they were told to someone. Sure. Like a a man, a traveler goes to this one island that's off the coast of, of Valinor, and he's told the events in prose rather than it being a, an eclectic epic. Okay. So the person, the elf, telling the story, I think it's an elf, the elf telling the story makes a comment and says, uh, essentially he says, We've all, we elves have always wondered 
and the ability of men to create in the world. Hmm. Because men were more... Uh, men, men's unique gift, what distinguishes them from elves, is an ability to sort of change the course of history. Hmm. Where elves were a little bit more... They were a little bit more uh, in tune with the flow of, like, fate, almost. Sure. Huh. Which is interesting because, they like, elves do change the course of history with the stealing of the Cimmerils, and they really did some terrible things that backfired gravely. But men had a unique... Humanity had a, had a unique... They could uniquely challenge fate. Sure. In, in Tolkien's letters, he describes how, like, Gandalf can... Gandalf's a mire. He's one of the lowest levels of, of angels. Okay. Gandalf can see the future, but he can only see the future insofar as he can see the themes that Iluvatar proposed to the angels. So okay. he can see how... You can see how Middle Earth should be playing out. Yeah. But what makes his visions not, or his his foresight, what makes it not perfect, yeah, is because he can't foresee what the individual wills of men will do, huh? Because they're in, independent agents, sure, that can work either for or against the theme of Illuminar. That's really interesting. Yeah, that I, that merits its own whole podcast episode, but like. On like the theme of prophecy itself, mm-hmm. not not to open the entire can of worms now, but like a lot of people who have do- devotions, maybe of Our Lady of Fatima, or maybe they've heard of the Saint Malachi prophecy, like things like that, and it's like these, so to speak, like mo- modern prophecies. You know, sometimes questionably Gnostic, some of those things. It's like okay, this will happen. Like these will be the like this is the list of the popes. Like full stop. If this amount of people don't do, you know, consecrate Russia, pray the rosary, like, this will happen, etc. And I've always found that, like, like kind of hard to, like, a hard pill to swallow sometimes. And, and you know, I'm, I'm losing a lot of the nuance talking about it, obviously. Yeah. But kind of like, like, God has given us free wills, and he's given every human being, like, the, the ability to, to relate to him and interact with him and to work within the world. So I think like there's just sometimes a little bit of danger to give too much merit to prophecy as like like the end. Mm-hmm. I mean the fullness of like the prophets. Think of the Old Testament prophets is Jesus Himself. So once Jesus is revealed, like the prophets are complete. Like Jesus is the period at the end of all prophecy. Right. So I think like I don't know. Just going back to this, like so Saint Malachi prophecy. There's there's going to be X amount of popes, and then like this is the last pope. That just seems like, well, where's Jesus at the end of that? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I don't know. This For is what it's worth, I think the, I think the, the writings of St. Malachi, I mean, I don't know, who knows how authentic the writings of St. Malachi yeah, that's are. That's true. I do think that it ends with the return of Peter and the coming of the Lord. Hmm. But what I will affirm, not that I'm not thinking I get to the, the minutia of St. Malachi, what I will say, though, is... As where is your, where is God in your hearing of mm. the St. Malachi prayer, I think is also. Sure. So if you hear, not the St. Malachi prayer, the St. Malachi prophecy. Well, it's, it, you know, it's like today's gospel. Sure. That might be too self relevatory depending on when we publish this, but mm. um, today's gospel, it's like, well, you're going to hear about wars and famines and the rest of it. Yeah. You can hear that gospel and be like, nuts, uh, there can be wars and famines. God's saying no. Here, here, I am going to be with you. I am going to yeah. be the words you speak. I am going to be your testimony. I am going to be your arguments. And that's that's the the thesis. You're supposed yeah. to. Yeah. That's where God is, and in, in the hearing of these prophecies is where is is Christ enough in you mm. that you can. Which let's bring it all back. That's sort of like that's what we're talking about with imagination. Yeah. Right. How are you imagining these prophecies playing out? Mm. If you have Christ centered in 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 you, yeah. And then you're able to look outside of yourself and not worry about your own fear, trepidation, but look outside of yourself, focus on Christ, and hear these prophecies and be like, "Well, this is just something that's going to be transitory." Yeah. Focusing on Christ, and when you imagine these prophecies playing out, it changes the whole your whole imagination of of how you, you know, your whole imagination it changes how you imagine these things. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Beautiful. There you go. Let's get humbly. Yeah, I'm going to use that. That's that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah, so that's that's really neat. Yeah, the elves changing the or elves kind of 
follow through the flow of the fates and, and Gandalf can kind of see ahead as far as before free will is kind of involved in it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I kind of wonder how that, how does that translate into our lives today and with, you know, with our Lord. So I'd have to think about that a lot more, but I do think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. When, when we center on Christ, we just have confidence like that we are functioning within his harmony, of, mm-hmm. you know, the fates, so to speak, um, which is really his divine will. Yeah, I think what it comes down to is, like, God is really on our side. I mean, this is stemming, stemming too far from the whole topic of imagination. Hmm. Full disclosure to our listeners, I'm talking a lot about the Lord of the Rings because that's my thesis topic. Right. I'm writing my, I'm getting my master's in Tolkien studies. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, theology via, via Tolkien. You know, when Melkor introduced Discord into, into the harmony and of, of Iluvatar how it plays out to how it plays out in middle earth is turmoil so it says that the the varda the the angels who are closest to earth who are in charge of creating it says that the Cimmerian says that um, they created mountains and melkor leveled them they created valleys and melkor filled them all that the, the angels were trying to do mm. on earth was undone and challenged by Melkor's discord. Mm. Right. The Varda knew that quote unquote like the children of Iluvatar, the elves mm. and, and men, were coming and they needed to prepare a world for them. And it was only for that reason that the Varda challenged Melkor and, and imprisoned him and went to war against him and made him stop the turmoil mm. in the world. Mm. Okay. And there's a line that's very striking. I wish I could remember it verbatim, but the line is, and Melkor never forgot that it was on behalf of the children of Iluvatar the Varda went to war. And I think that's very profound because it shows we are the the center of God's and the angels' affections. Mm. That it wasn't for their own work. It was for love of us. I mean, assuming that the similar is real, it's going for. <laughs> it's like it was for love of us that the angels definitively acted, mm-hmm. which I think is a commentary. It's it's again going back to the theme of imagination. Uh-huh. Through Tolkien's imagination, I think he really has a, an insight and expressed a good insight on the interiority of God and his angels. Okay. God can take a beating. Hmm. I don't want to get crass, but I think that the the passion and the death of Christ proves that. That God God can endure yeah. much. So Lucifer could have fallen. Lucifer could have could have fallen and and cast himself into hell, as Tolkien says, like cast himself into the void. And like God probably could have continued not offended or insulted by that. Hmm. But I think I think, and I don't know what the church would say about this, I think, I think Tolkien thinks this too, God acts in the way he does because he's protecting us. Hmm. And that motivates him hmm. in in much that of what he does. And I think the sure. angels do the same thing. That the sure. discord between good and evil is because of, because we're being harmed by it. Yeah. And he moves to protect us. You know, that plays into the whole the whole idea of prophecy. It's like God's not... Whatever happens, whatever punishment we endure for not living up to his expectations, whether we're caught in the crossfire hmm. or, you know, wars and turmoil just because of the, the, the groaning and the labor pains at the end of time, it's not like God is apathetic to us. Right. And thank God for Tolkien's imagination that, you know, I personally and all the other homeschool Tolkien scholars mm-hmm. in the world can... can receive that insight um you know all things being equal that we are really at the center of this whole thing yeah we're really at the center of this whole thing just in general and i think the incarnation really proves that that god became man now he he is with us in the center of the whole thing yeah yeah i mean john three sixteen is you know as the god so loved the world that he sent his only son and i think like like maybe we've just heard that so much yeah. That it maybe loses its meaning, but it's like God so loved the world 
And it's like that's that should be awe inspiring. Mm-hmm. Like it is awe inspiring. It's amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I I agree. You can also interpret that as for God so loved the world that he did not send a bureaucratic committee. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. Yeah. 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 Awesome. I'm glad to have learned more about the Cimmerillion and Tolkien from you. I like. I really do appreciate. I never grew up with like a big being a Tolkien scholar, even though I was homeschooled and all that. I was gonna say you're homeschooled. Where was <laughs> <laughs> I like we, we read Chronicles of Narnia and watched the Lord of the Rings movies, but I never read Tolkien. Anyway, but it is neat to just hear how much. Like obviously, I think a lot of his inspiration was inspired by the Bible. And, and Thomas Aquinas, I'm sure, like that that angelology, like the choirs of angels, angels right. like that seems to come from Aquinas. Like it had to be inspired by that because you don't just like make up those things by yourself. But it is great to see like how you know with his own imagination, he was able to to make that into a new story and a whole like a new world to tell stories in. Right. Yeah. In, in a great way. Right. For what it's worth, that's a lot of a huge part of the MA is mm. discerning. And discovering how much he knew going into the project. Yeah, um, you know, he was a student at the at the oratory founded by Saint John Newman. No, John Henry. Newman? John Henry Newman. Yep. Right. So he had a classical education, but he also has his finger on the pulse. I, I'll put it this way: he has an insight that I think is oftentimes inexplicable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so a part of the my research is just discovering what he knew and what was almost prophetic, I guess right. you could say, yeah, so sure. far as not to tell yeah. the future, but rather just, was he a mystic? I, yeah. I think um, yeah, absolutely. Joseph Pierce argues that he was in one of his chapters of mm. Tolkien, Man and Myth. Mm. So, yeah, that's there's a, there's a lot to be said there. Excellent. Well, hopefully, listeners, this episode was as edifying and enlightening to you, maybe inspired some of your interest to... Look into your own creativity and see what, what gifts can God give to you through that. Hopefully you'll join us for our next episode of the Sem Says Podcast. See you later.